do uh, Alastair. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we are going to be fast when we go through this. We've got the timing down to a down to feather thin timing. The reason we can do this is because it is recorded. So if there's something that you want to go over in more time, come back to it yourself. Secondly, that the accompanying learning resource. Um, will be in your possession and we'll point you to that in about four minutes time and let you load it so you can follow it yourself if you want to and look at it again afterwards and thirdly we're trying to maximize the time that you have to um, first of all hear directly from practitioners and secondly for you to swap the expertise that you have and the questions you have and to work as a community so <clears throat> um, if we look at the next uh, slide, the introduction is our standard introduction. Uh, we are going to be looking primarily at teaching, learning and assessment and how videos can support with that. We do have some definitions. Um, we've had a little bit of a think about where videos start and ends. So we're really thinking about this range here from simple moving images like a narrated PowerPoint to full audio visual content, including a load of stuff in between, things that are perhaps authored and edited content with a mix of images, audio and text. Um, I'm going to skip over our normal introduction in the background about this session because uh, you can come back and look at that later. So we're going to go straight on to About Us and again Lillian is on the left, I'm in the middle and Ron is on the right. And so you'll see more of us later and the project Ron will say a little bit more about right at the end. For now we'd like you to um, have a look at this. If, you, if you're happy with multitasking, having two things open at the same time, then here's a link in the text chat to, oh there, Ron's put it in there already, he's so quick. If you open that up, that will allow you to follow along with us. Now there's a really important reason why you'd like why we'd like you to do that and that's because we have a number of interactivities where we're asking you to share things and because we've embedded that content those kind of interactive materials into this presentation it's much easier for you to do it all within that learning object than for us to give you a load of different links and you end up with 30 windows open. So the very first thing, and if you've got this open up, you can go on to the next slide on your, um, you know, on your own view of the learning object, because here is what we always produce at the beginning of the session, which is the mind map, which in many ways is saying, look, folk, we know we're not going to cover everything. We know that this is a big area. Come back to this any point you want. There are lots of links in there. There's lots of little notes in there. Um, and you can move around, it's completely um, interactive, you can magnify it, shrink it, and if we get Ron to wiggle, he can wiggle, you know, move into different um, areas, different arms. And if there's some little, uh, if there's a little arrow next to anything, that's going to give you a hyperlink out to, um, to a site. And if there's not an arrow, but there's like three little lines next to something, then that will give you uh, just below there, the earth science one, three little lines will give you some additional notes, for example, that you can read. So that's for you to look at in your own time. We're going to be covering a selection of that, but feel free to come back to that anytime, use it with staff training and so on. So I'm going to pass over to Ron now, just to look at what you said in registration. Yeah, um, just to very quickly point out that you can read these in your own time originally we just included the the question um, how do you currently make use of video but but actually we decided to also include what you'd said that you most want to learn from this session and again it reinforces what Alistair said that we can't possibly cover everything or meet everybody's individual needs and differing needs but also you'll see that there's some commonality um, lecture capture for instance um, appears multiple times and, and so there are a few of the other things like flip learning and so on. So you can come back to that in your own time. What we'd like you to do as the first activity is to answer this question or this two part question. What were the last things or most memorable, memorable things you learned from or taught yourself 
via online videos? Um, and why did you choose that, that, you know, to learn in that way? So in the text chat, not in the, the kind of the screenshot of the text chat, but in the text chat that you've all been using as we're waiting for everybody to, to join and start, um, respond to those, that two part question. What were the last things or most memorable things you learned from and taught yourself via online video? And why did you choose to learn that way? And the three of us um, will kind of unpick what kind of responses that you, you share with us and um, some additional comments as, as you're typing those in. It's interesting that um, often what we'll get with responses here will be much more about our personal interest and an informal interest and choices to to learn that via video than than the kind of more formal um, use of video that we might be talking about in our uh, day jobs. Um, Lillian and Alastair, you can pick out responses as well that. that are worth commenting on. Oh, there are just some great ones. I particularly I, loved how to floss. I, that that caught my eye as well. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, but yeah, I think a lot more of us are using, um, like, you need to learn a piece of software, so you just jump on and and, and find it. Be, partly because it's it's getting quite time consuming to create these handouts. Uh, or print versions. So people are making video versions because it's faster for them to make it. But from my perspective, I prefer to kind of quickly scan through the how-tos and get to them. So I, I, I find myself speeding up videos if I need to get to something quite quickly. I think Nigel said there about the, the way it's much easier to learn practical skills by video. Mm. I would also say that often my IT skills, I will try to you know, use YouTube or Vimeo to, to learn. But the problem is that because they go out of date much more quickly, you can end up looking at an interface that bears no relation to the interface you've got in front of you. So the, there can be some issues of some things lend themselves more because they've got more longevity and they lend themselves more to a good video. Whereas, you know, an interface like using YouTube, I've just tweaking the captions on YouTube. Um, it took me ages to find them because they've got a new beta creator studio, which ironically doesn't have captions anywhere featured on it. And I had to go and find out how to go back to classic. So yeah, lots of different things, horses for courses, but um, some real options there. Mm, very good point, Tim, that about filtering for the most recent as well. But yeah. as, as uh, Alistair says, sometimes you want to actually go back in time and find something of an old version, uh, depending on the software that you have as well. So that's what's good. We've got quite a nice back catalogue. And I know we're going to come on to this as well, but you do have to be a critical thinker as well and, and, and make critical choices about which one you follow. And, uh, you know, in, in example i'm thinking of is is a particular diy skill like you know how to you know paint neatly in in the in, in the uh, the gap between the the ceiling and the wall kind of thing and you'll find about 15 different suggestions as to you know the best way to do that and so on and so you know it, you do have to you can consume an awful lot of time kind of finding the right tutorial for the right skill and and so mm. on can't you I'm interested in Dominic's um, comment there about couldn't figure it out from the stupid manual. Um, that's something that I have uh, often thought myself many times with things. But I think there's a deeper and uh, quite serious point there about sometimes there's a significant percentage of our students that can't figure things out from the stupid manual. In other words, from the handouts that we give them, where a short video about something might, particularly for a dyslexic student, make a real difference to them. Mm. And as Sharon says, you can keep repeating the video till you figure it out. You can pause, you can rewind. Um, and sometimes when you reread something, it's still not going in. But the thing about video is it's multi-channel. It's using your, your audio as well as your visual senses. So your brain can actually use more. Well, you're using more parts of your brain to kind of um, understand Let's, let's take that because I think that's a very good segue there, Lillian, into um, our next slide, which is where we're going to be looking 
at the why of video. And what I've picked out is I've picked out three whys. Um, and again, I won't go over all the details in all of them because you can come back to these, but I'll, I'll give you the perhaps the top level points for these. So the, the first why of video is inclusion because there are really significant potential benefits for people with print impairments, for people like Dominic saying, yeah, I can't figure it out from the stupid manual. Um, so people with dyslexia, people with different language background who are used to writing from right to left instead of left to right, sometimes just reading things is more difficult than seeing a video or listening to somebody narrating. Uh, that would also apply for deaf people um, you know, who are sign language users. A short video may actually be better, even if it's not particularly signed, if they can just see what's happening in a process, that may be better for them. And people with poor literacy skills. So there's a lot of potential benefits amongst the groups you would expect where text is less good. There's also some unexpected benefits because Contrary to what people might believe, a video, whilst it could potentially create a barrier for deaf people and for blind people all at the same time, because it's got both narration and visuals, not all videos will rely equally on the narration and the video. So the, there could well be some unexpected beneficiaries where blind people can use a video really easily because it's got clear narration and the deaf people could use a different type of video it's got very little narration but it's really important to minimize barriers and this is the cue to Mike Wald if you want to pop anything in the text chat there are various ways of minimizing barriers uh, first of all make sure that people get to the keyboard if they can't use a mouse and then think of captions transcripts or even at least teaching point summaries we'll come back to that in a moment because the next slide looks at another why of video which is the whole cognition thing because video can be richer now when you're on this page and when you come back to it in your own time you can click on any of these uh, links to open up uh, another panel i'm only going to talk about the very first one it's a fantastic example um it's the youtube fridays project at the colorado school of mines where they use videos in a way that's really contextualizes things in real life and is very engaging and it gets students working discussing YouTube videos. So they look at a video and then they have to work out, okay, is that fake? Is it not fake? If that happened, if you get six firemen lift a car 20 feet in the air just with the power of their hoses, let's look at the engineering principles and work out the ratio of hose inlet area to outlet area to create enough velocity to lift the car. Fantastic way of working almost backwards from video back to education. And on the next one, so there's lots of cognition benefits, but the next slide I want to focus on the engagement. Now there's a really nice um, link that we've put here. There's some brilliant links in the mind map that you can come back to. But this one looks at uh, the specifics of different ways you can engage people. And we did have uh, one of the preparatory comments that people put in there that came up a few times was, how can I get students to engage more with the videos we've already got? And that might be partly to do with relevance and to do with whether it's part of an assignment, to do with you know, whether it's an optional extra, which nobody opts for the optional extras, or whether it's actually core to the teaching. But again, in your own time, go through these because this is a really nice list. And it's come from uh, somebody working with the BBC and the Open University for years. And it's, it's their guidance. They've got a really good video tutorial. But looking at these things can help you work out, hey, yes, I could put more of this in my video and that might work. So that, I think, takes us on to the caveats. I've called this the seven C's, the perils of the seven C's. Um, <clears throat> and first of all pedagogically so this is the skeptic this is what might go wrong why might people not engage with my videos why might my videos not be very good and to, to some extent it's to do with context some things work better by text to some extent it might be coherence it might be there's been no storyboarding and it's rambling and all over the place it could be connection because it's just passive there's not been enough pedagogy and purpose to it there are also some technical reasons and the, the, under the technical tab, we can see that there's things like, you know, the clarity. Um, and I was hoping somebody might click the technical tab very quickly. 
clarity, compatibility, compression, and captions. And then fundamentally, I'll just come back to this. So if you look at the accessibility one, um, accessibility is so important and you know it's covered under the caption C, but do come back and have a look at this because although auto captioning can be brilliant, and I had 100% success on a video I captioned recently just with the auto captioning, it doesn't always work like that. And so there are some guidance there on what the minimum should be, what the optimum might be, uh, and so on. And then I'm going to go back now, I think, to Lillian. Um, that's right. Um, so what we'd like you to do now, and you can um, jump back to your copy of the learning object, um, is to uh, interact with us to let us know where you find your video sources. So I, I know not everybody uses video sources that they find, but if you were um, involved in looking for background resources for your learners at all, or if you're aware of colleagues who actually use certain video sources, um, feel free to pop them onto the Padlet um, and add any comments as well about any uh, plus or negative points of doing these things, um, how you support your learners in using these tools. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a great resource for all of us to kind of take away from this event. Um, so yeah, we can see Bob a box of broadcasts. Yeah. And if you're having problems adding, do make sure that you're not trying to add them through Ron's screen. Mm. So add them yeah, through your, your own learning object. Um, auto captioning, Adam's asking if it's a YouTube only thing. I guess uh, other providers are trying to provide it. I think Panopto is one of them that I know of. Others might know of other people uh, who caption. Dominic says Vimeo and MS Stream. But um, we always have to check your captions. I mean, I, I, I pronounce certain words in a funny way that, you know, I don't have the, the beautiful diction that Alistair has, for instance. Um, so yeah, your video sources, including self-created ones, um, free stock video, that's great. We, uh, some of the links might be things that we don't already have, so that's great. Um, a future learn edX, yeah, lots of nice uh, Lots of nice uh, sources, and if there are some that you've not uh, come across before, then clearly after the webinar is over, this is a resource for all of us to go back to, uh, and we can maybe explore a few more of those uh, options, which is really, really good. So, um, if something pops into your head, by all means, come back to the resource and pop that in. That's really, really good. Um, but we're going to go and look at the kind of video sources that we came up with, um, and some of them overlap with yours. So uh, TED, Ed, TED Ed, um, which has been mentioned, Box of Broadcasts, um, RSA Animate, and you know, I, I guess what we're seeing is that is YouTube, but looking at YouTube. Um, with a more criticality, you're selecting a, a kind of slightly more high quality channel and then looking at the other playlists that it recommends that kind of keeps you on higher quality materials. Um, the other thing that we thought was useful as well, and someone else mentioned it previously, um, having some stock motion video clips. Sometimes you just want a bit of video um, to start your clip rather than just bang, you're straight into you talking. You can have a title page with a bit of video in the background. Um, and our first page on our learning resource here is an example of that. Uh, Khan Academy, I think um, from a very academic uh, material point of view, is a great resource um, as well as, you know, Common Craft, but more from a kind of, uh, it, it, it's a commercial uh, product, but it's low priced and that makes it feasible for you to embed, if you like, uh, explanations um, that cut across the entire student population. That's quite useful. And for those of you, I, I got this from one of my tutors, Tube Quizard, uh, which is beginning to kind of um, take something that is a YouTube video and allow you to create some quizzes with it. Um, so that was quite interesting to to come across. But if you have other tools like that, please do bob them into the um, Padlet on page 12. But in the meantime, we'll go on to the next thing about, of course, 
copyright because we're using found resources um, and we, we have to either embed it so it goes back to the original source. Uh, I've worked with colleagues who used to ask me, how uh, do I download the video and upload it to the VLE? Well, we don't really want um, things like that to happen as much as possible. We should always send people back to the original site if we can um, and or attribute the source uh, if it's a Creative Commons uh, licensed product. And um, I take your point, Graham, you know, some people hate RSA Animate. Some people hate the common craft look because it's, it's almost getting too common. Um, but what's interesting is that you, you can find such a range of techniques now that you can create a video assignment using any kind of technique and, and allow the students to be creative that way. Okay, so um, what we'd like to then uh, mention is this Creative Commons slide for those who haven't um, joined our webinars before. The last three have been about rich media and um, we've mentioned um, Creative Commons uh, sources. Um, this learning object, for instance, we've licensed uh, as Creative Commons, which means you can download it, you can reuse it uh, in your organizations. Uh, and similarly, you can always look for Creative Commons uh, sources for videos that allow you to kind of reuse the video uh, in your own organization. Um, right. And we are now going on to our promo example. So some, I'm going to hand that over to Ron. Just before we do that, uh, there were a couple of people in the text chat couldn't find the padlets. So it may be that if you joined a little late or you might, might have missed the link to the learning object, I've popped that in there again. Um, if you open up the learning object and then follow around to the appropriate slide, we're now on slide 12, coming up 13, you'll be able to find the padlets. You will need the padlets. There's some more padlets later on in the learning object. Sorry, Ron. Yeah, the, the direct link that I've put in there now should take us to the page that we're looking on on screen. And, and as we, we often uh, try to clarify it, you'll, you'll need to, this is another padlet, and you'll need to respond in the, in the copy that you have rather than the, the screen share that I'm sharing right now. Um, so we have a, a, another very quick uh, uh, activity here. Hopefully most of you saw the, the little promos that we did um, in advance. So we did those for a, a particular reason that we'll, we'll unpick further, but um, basically just to demonstrate that um, it's, it's very easy and quick um, to create uh, video resources and the kind of explainer type videos. In our case, we just um, chose a, a fairly ordinary promo um, type video, but uh, the same techniques and the same principles apply to teaching and learning videos that you might create in this way. And we went from um, the low tech uh, in Alice, Alistair's case, using a, a camera and uh, Bob Dylan style captions to um, to slightly more kind of visual effects in PowerPoint um, with Lillian's and mine. Um, so what we were suggesting was to give the thumbs up or thumbs down to those videos and to add any comments that you might want to do. Um, but we'll keep this little interaction very short because we, we do want to move on and, and ensure that our guest speakers have got plenty of time as well. Um, I've had a comment that it was interesting I went for portrait rather than landscape. And that, that was kind of user error. It wasn't a, an aesthetic choice. It was more a fearful choice. I thought, if I put my camera sideways, will I have it sideways um, the right way up portrait or sideways upside down portrait? And I wasn't confident enough about my camera to know which was which. So I just decided to go for portrait. Yeah, we did say, Alistair, that we'll we'll we have to link in the. Um, there's a there's quite a few videos on on YouTube, quite funny videos about uh, never shoot video in portrait. And uh, well, I, I got my wrist slapped by somebody. <laughs> I can't remember who it was. Somebody out. There. <laughs> But um, there are lots of techniques. I think um, you'll see in the news, you know, people have just caught video portrait because it's something tall, so they've gone for it. And what they do is they, they edit it with a, a version of the video in the background to fill the screen just so there's a little bit more, you know, uh, you don't have the black stripes down the side. And that's quite a common technique. It's a lot more acceptable than it used to be. Um, Dominic's uh, 
added a nice link in there. Um, and I hope, Dominic, you, you pop that back into the uh, Padlet as well, because that looks like a very useful resource. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, again, we're, we're pinpointing resources that you can come back to that we don't have time to cover in the webinar. But Alistair Lynn and I um, did a quick Zoom recording, which is an, another really easy way of recording video, particularly if you want to record video with a number of people. Um, we recorded our discussion about how we each created those little promo videos and the rationales and reasons behind those techniques. So you can watch those in your own time. Um, I don't think it's too long a video. It's just, yeah, it's about 10 minutes, um, but, but covers the kind of step-by-step -step, um, way that we each created those videos. So now it's time for the first of our guest speakers today. And I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and hand over to Rob to um, share yours. Uh, just need to and we're bang on time which is really impressive <laughs> we just need rob and tim to keep to their times as well <laughs> we set you a standard guys <laughs> ah, i seem to have encountered a problem that zoom has disappeared it's probably minimized rob so it'll be a little um rectangular black window somewhere either in the taskbar or over Ah, there we go. Thank you for that. Right. Shit. There we go. So can we all see that? Am I on? Yep. Great. Okay, so my name's Rob. Uh, I'm from the University of Derby. I'm a learning technologist. I've got a background in video production and educational video production. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about getting feedback on videos that you make and, and why it's important and some of the questions you might ask. I've got a few links in there to some of the content that we've made in the past. Um, you know, feel free to have a look at those in your own time. Hopefully they'll be useful. Please let us know if they are. Um, now when we think about creating video, it's generally done through some kind of workflow. And I've created a, a very simple one here uh, with three stages. So we've got the planning stage, figuring out what you want to do, and in the case of educational video, trying to justify why it's the best video for the teaching that you want to do. Um, then we've got the production stage, so we're going to make it, and then you've got the necessary skills, that kind of thing. You're going to perform in it, you're going to direct it, and then we need to deliver it. So we need students to actually watch it. Now, there's lots of things that can happen in all of these, but it gives us quite a nice framework to think about the process and what we can actually learn from it, from both the teacher perspective and the student perspective. And we're really keen at Derby that when we work with um, teachers that we get feedback from their point of view. And really what we're looking to do is find out if they felt that the video enhanced their teaching, did they learn something about teaching with video? Um, we're trying to reflect on the process and refine it so that we can share good practice. Because what we see is that subject specific areas have their own teaching method. So we know that places like social care, like using case studies, maths, engineering, like using whiteboards. So there's very different ways that they teach. And we need to be able to kind of pick out ways that they might have approached videos to see if we can share them to other areas. We also know that there are various personal teaching styles and there may be barriers around getting those on video. So really what we're trying to figure out is, it, was it worth it for the teacher? in creating a video and how can we use that information to help the next person to iterate on that design. Now, on the flip side of that, we also get feedback from students. So um, these are some questions that we always ask at the end of modules if we've used a particular video and we want to get some feedback. And what we're trying to do here is build a complete picture of whether, whether that video worked in its educational context. Um, now, what the important thing that we're looking for is not necessarily have they watched it. We, we, we can check that, you know, through metrics and things. But what we're trying to find out is, did the use of video have any advantages over other teaching methods for the students? So did they get anything extra because we that video? Uh, and then what way did it impact on the way that we, we learned? So we'll give these out to students. And, and generally, um, we usually get positive comments. In fact, the negative comments 
are usually around technical aspects. So if they couldn't open the video, for instance, that is a complete barrier to the learning. Um, another thing that's useful is anecdotal evidence. So quite often, if you just ask the students whether they liked the videos, um, they'll tell you. And we get emails, or academics do, and they'll tell us that students have stopped in the corridor and said that video did was brilliant. It really helped me understand uh, what I needed to. So don't be afraid to ask or tell students, uh, you know, find out whether your, your video had any impact on them, because they will tell you. And just to give you a quick example, um, we created some video for fashion studies. Uh, this is quite a few years ago now, but it's actually had quite an impact on, on the way that we teach people to use video here. Uh, there was a couple of different styles. So one was a practical demonstrations of pattern cutting. And the key thing that we got from that was that students loved the fact that the tutor was the person who made the videos. They, they felt that they were accessible to them when they weren't there. As we said before, it really humanized the process. They absolutely loved it. And when academics or teachers say to us, they don't necessarily want to be in the videos, we use that as an example of why it's really important. Uh, conversely to that, we were also, uh, the academic was filming students doing presentations uh, with an iPad, she was doing it handheld, this was so that students could reflect on them and the students really didn't like that. They didn't like the intrusive nature of the production in this case, not necessarily that they didn't like the idea of having the video, they didn't like the way it was being filmed. And again, so now when we're filming presentations, we'll always try to make things as unintrusive as possible. Um, you can find some more information about that project and those more examples of student feedback at the link that's on there. Um, so just to sum up, um, what we're really trying to say is don't just create a video, try and consider how and why it enhanced your teaching and then check if it did. Um, be open with your students, They'll tell you straight away if it works or not. There's a couple of examples of things that we've had from them there on the screen, which again, we use to inform uh, what other people do. And really just reflect on the entire process. Build a picture of whether the whole thing worked for both the teacher and for the student. And that five minutes has gone very quickly, but I think um, I've just about done it. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. If you stop your screen sharing, um, you'll be able to check the text chat and respond to any questions while, um, Timothy, um, you can start screen sharing yours. Okay. I, I certainly had a, a comment there. I was very interested, Rob, that about that intrusion element that the students didn't like the iPad being held kind of up close to them. Did did you have any sense that it kind of varied with some students? Some students actually liked being centre stage and others didn't? Uh, there was a couple who, who didn't mind it. Um, but the general feeling was that it was getting in the way of, the, of them actually presenting. They, wow. were there to, they were there to do a presentation and this was something yeah. else that was you know, making them nervous. Some students really didn't yeah. mind. But, yeah. uh, it certainly changed how we thought about how we capture those sort of videos. I was just asked for a reminder, planning, production and? Delivery. Great. Okay. Maria was on the ball there. Thanks, Maria. Are we? Timothy. Ready? Yep. Okay, so uh, my name is Timothy Smale. I'm a learning technologist with the Kiel Institute for Innovation and uh, Teaching Excellence. Um, and uh, one of the things that I help our students to, to deal with is, is by producing uh, rich and engaging media for, for our health students. And healthcare is a very hands-on profession. Um, and active learning and student-centred approaches um, really should be paramount to, to the way that we're helping them learn. Uh, but adequate tutor supervision to enable this is, has remained a key challenge for us, especially in some of our, our larger cohorts. So we try to provide videos to our students and uh, 
this kind of worked but it then it kind of just replaced the lecturer standing at the front so they place it up on the big screen and it still didn't make it any easier for the students to kind of engage and see this so one of the things that we decided to do was to mount ipads in our practical rooms uh, alongside all of the plinths this is in the school of health and rehabilitation which is our physiotherapy course so we mounted these uh, these ipads and made sure that they enabled hands-free viewing so they're on articulated arms. Um, people can can then view them, position them so that uh, they're visible whilst their hands on with the uh, patient in inverted commons, which is, is another student. Um, and the nice thing about the iPads as well is they had wipeable screens so we could tick the infection control issue. So this is one of our larger practical rooms and you can see that every plinth um, has an iPad mounted above it. Um, typically two students to a plinth, one being the, the demonstration uh, patient and, and the other uh, practicing their skills. Um, we like to produce, as I said, our own videos. Um, we typically film and edit those um, in-house. So we have an audiovisual services team, um, but some of the videos we, we will do ourselves. Uh, we have uh, equipment that we can just book out. So this is myself uh, doing some filming uh, several years ago and, and even five six years ago we've been filming in full hd um back then we weren't able to deliver it in full hd we are now um i'd love to get to 4k we're not not quite ready for 4k um but we now host all of our videos on youtube now we're a g suite for education site um that's uh, means that we're subscribed to google um but we found that the best way of delivering this video content to students so that it is device agnostic, they can just pick up any of their devices that are internet enabled and, and access this content was YouTube. Um, we do obviously have a slight issue with certain countries that, that block access to YouTube and we're looking at making, it, uh, making a fallback uh, available to them on our different site. But YouTube does tend to be the, the best method for us to deliver the content to the students. Now we put the videos up as unlisted so that the public can't find them. Um, that's probably more from a liability and, and staff reassurance angle that, than uh, anything else, to be honest. Now, we wanted to be able to deliver those to appropriate, stu uh, appropriate students and cohorts. Um, and we wanted to be able to, to provide them short and long versions of the videos. So the short ones, we wanted them to be able to use in, in the practical sessions back here uh, with the iPads and the longer ones, we wanted them to be able to look back on at home during revision periods. And we needed a, a platform to be able to host these, uh, sorry, there's a, an example video there if people would like to go and watch. I've had permission from uh, our lecturer Helen and you can see the kind of quality that we that we did this is one I, I filmed and edited myself and it really was very quick and simple to to, to do uh, I'll explain a bit more if I get time at the end but we wanted to be able to, to centralize these videos there's no point having loads of videos around and as, as somebody said before you get the the member of staff that says how do I take a copy of this video and put it into my virtual learning environment do I download it and upload it and, and then you get the IT services asking why certain courses on the virtual learning environment are several gigabytes in size. Um, and so myself and my colleague, Peter Lonsdale, actually uh, have built a videos repository. Now I say we host them on YouTube, so it's really just a database, but it does mean that we're able to do some, some really nice things. So we've collated all of our skills demonstrations we also bring in our pre-recorded presentations. Now, this isn't lecture capture. They're hosted on a, a separate system, but our pre-recorded presentations and our staff and student how-to videos. How do I submit to Turnitin? How do I get onto the VLE? Now, alongside that, we can link in with MCQ self-evaluation. So it allows the student to do some self-learning and self-reflection. Um, and we can also repurpose that for, for feedback as... Um, Rob was saying to, to be able to get some information from the students if they how they engaged with those videos. Now the important thing is that staff have access control over the videos. Now as I said they are unlisted on YouTube so if a student decides to share the link to the video then somebody else would have access but the idea is that we don't give first year students access to clinical skills that we wouldn't expect them to undertake until they were in the third year so that they're not attempting um, risky procedures that they've not been um, trained to do properly. 
Another nice thing is that it's now been used. It's now used university wide, mainly for um, the the how to videos. Uh, a lot of staff started to notice that we we had this rich resource of videos, and they're now sharing those across the university. Um, over the last year, uh, we now have uh, over three hundred videos currently held in the repository. They were accessed from sixteen countries with sixteen thousand. Um, independent page views of the videos um, which is circa 16,000 views but sometimes people will have watched those videos multiple times in a single session um, and we had about 10,000 sessions. Now I take the countries one with a little bit of salt because we did have a student um, we released a video and we're like, they're, they're all in the practical room why is this showing that students watching it in the USA and it turns out the students still had their VPN connection turned on with Tunnel Bear so they could watch um, Netflix in the United States. So just, just be careful when, when looking at your uh, analytical data in Google from, from your countries. Feedback from our students, overwhelmingly positive uh, and showing us that they, they really find benefit in having these uh, resources available to them. Oh, sorry, a little, little running over there a little bit, but uh, hopefully that gives you a flavour of, of what we've been doing here. That's brilliant, Tim. I think it's uh, very thorough, and I think we're quite jealous of uh, you having the equivalent of a repository. Is this, uh, someone was asking, is it a repository made in-house or a third party? So it's uh, one we've made in house uh, it's very very simple it's an asp.net um, platform that uses a microsoft sql database and we use a bootstrap front end uh, for those that aren't familiar with bootstrap it just means that the style and design of the page works on any device so we don't have to design a mobile phone version um, it'll, it'll just scale correctly to, to any device that you're using it on uh, that coupled with the fact that youtube will scale its video to the size of device and the connect, uh, connection speeds that you have really does make it a nice rounded resource for the students. So if you'd like to pop your email address in the chat for us mere mortals who might want to consult <laughs> you afterwards, Tim, that would be very welcome. I think Ron's taking over next. There you go. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks um, for that. And uh, can I just check, uh, are you seeing my screen now with the type yeah. of video. video yes we are yeah yeah okay so i'm going to try buy back some time so to skip through this very quickly um we put an introduction screen to just the types of video and it's mainly uh, an introduction to um the next page which we'll come on into in a minute um and the key point where however you describe and categorize the, the various types of video um the key messages that we wanted to unpick is that we can all make use of whatever type is most appropriate there are uh, very easy ways to do so regardless of existing experience or available technologies as we've seen from our kind of free promo examples if you like and that the lower tech and personalized examples can be just as effective as full-blown professional productions um, and and you can make it your own own mind up as to what types and style <laughs> and so on that you want to use and or create um, what we have here and, and I believe Graham um, is with us in the webinar is a resource that Graham Gibbs shared with us um, that's on YouTube and um, you'll be able to view this in your own time but we built a, a quick bit of interaction in Xerti and in the Xerti page that we're using so that you can quickly um, flick between those um, different types just to explore them and maybe uh, at some point when you're looking to create your own you, you use that as a reminder of of the different types that um, that Graham has included in um, his example. And there's a, um, uh, a link to uh, Graham's report. Um, you might want to co comment about that in the, the text chat, Graham. Um, but as I say, I'm trying to buy back some time, so we'll, we'll move on very quickly. And that's very much a, a resource and the examples that you can explore in your own time. Um, we also have this um, separate uh, selection of examples it's, it's by no means comprehensive um, but there there are a few that we've un, uh, unpicked and again resources that have been shared with us so there's a really nice guide to um, for students to 
uh, on using Panopto and some blog posts about how they use Panopto at Cardiff. <coughs> um, and in fact, a separate Xerti resource that a student created that I'll just very quickly open here that um, has a number of pages and talks about a similar model of um, you know uh, planning and and use and so on and reflection and then um from lillian i think lillian if you want to comment yeah. on this uh, yeah this was a research project in 2015 that we conducted with students and we asked them how they used lecture capture um, and we put their workflows together into a series of study tips so these are very short um, postcard size slides that are ideas to pass to your students on how to use lecture capture. And these were devised by other students. So um, they should actually find something that works for them uh, out of these pool of ideas. Another example that was suggested to us um, was from Adam Warren um, and a video there and a link to YouTube. And we've included a, um, a few common craft examples. Now I do remember earlier on, I think Lillian picked up that someone said they hate common craft. I'm, I'm not sure that that was common craft and not video scribe. And maybe we could debate what the, the difference is between the two. But for me, the, the real skill and, and craft with common craft is not necessarily the, the visual style or the informal style that they use. And, and they used to use stop frame animation, but it's the storytelling and the analogies that they conceive of um, and develop and refine in the telling of those stories. And we've included one here that's a very old one. Um, I think this is 2007, um, explaining Google Docs. Um, and I'm sure we're all very familiar with Google Docs now, but, and, the, and the benefits of it, but it was a really nice kind of analogy that they used. And, and there's a few examples there. There's also one I'll, I'll skip on just very quickly to um, a technique that they refer to as the Feynman technique. And actually when we think about it, this is what uh, myself, Lillian and Alistair use in the preparation for these webinars and the resources that we create that that often we're researching and, and finding um, resources and refining what we can and can't include in the, the short space of time and trying to make them um, you know plain English rather than technical jargon or heavy duty research and so on and so we try to make it um, you know, uh, usable and, and useful for everybody, um, which is not always an easy task, but um, there you go. And, and Alistair, you included a, a couple of extra links. Yeah, just very quickly, just a very quick demo showing how um, a bit of free software using Zoom, in fact, which we're using now, uh, but the free version of that allows you to do instant screencasting with video. I've got an example there made in live, you know, real time. And then the last one is uh, an example of lecture capture. I think it was using Panopto, but it was something that came in from the old list. Somebody suggesting one of their colleagues who uses it a lot in maths. So again, it was just to show people those, those range of different ways of working. Okay, so thanks, Alice. And moving on very quickly, we you know broke down the, the idea of creating video um, and we've, we've overlapped and in, and in the text chat discussed that quite a bit already, but... Uh, Really, it's a combination of equipment, the software apps and, and uh, creation techniques, um, the delivery, and, and also obviously the, the time, skills, and training considerations. Um, we started, and, and I, I have to confess that um, Lillian spurred me on to, to start creating this. We weren't going to include inf any information about hardware necessarily, um, but Lillian posted this picture from Leeds. It was the... only one picture. <laughs> I yeah. only did one picture. Look at you. I've created a monster. Uh, well, yeah, and it is very much draft information, and we're really looking, you can explore this in your own time. There's some suggestions and tips and so on, but what we're really looking for you to do is, is share um, additional resources and information in, in an exact activity very quickly and i think julian's with us there's um we've already shown how or, or described how we've used powerpoint to create those promos and there's an excellent resource here from julian tenney from the university of nottingham that he's used with students on digital storytelling using powerpoint and there's some additional examples um how to use powerpoint from microsoft site that you might want to again explore in your own time so another Padlet, another activity. What uh, equipment, tools and software do you use? Um, and I'll put the link in the text chat so you can go straight to that. You can't 
don't try to do that on my screen. You do need to open the resource to switch back to the resource, but share the the tools and software and apps that you use. And, and again, the, the, the range of mobile apps that are possible these days on tablets and smartphones, um, I'm sure we've all got our favorites and, and many to use, but um, share some thoughts there and we'll combine those into the resource. Um, but they'll be a part of the Padlet and you can add to this after the webinar as well. So, Lynn and Alistair, I, I think we've almost caught up with the, the time there, but... Um, just I'm, as well I'm typing people, things in the Padlet, I am. <laughs> I think it's just as well that people can slow uh, recordings down as well as speed them up <laughs> the way that we're going. But yeah, a lot of interesting um, contributions to the Padlet here. Some things uh, we, we might expect and some things we video, for instance, I, I'd go off and explore that afterwards. Um, I've, I've seen Adobe Spark mentioned, but not used it myself. Someone else using PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, quite, quite interesting. Rapid MOOC, that's quite interesting. So some interesting links for us to explore after the webinar, I think. Um, well, we've got another slide to move to now uh, about related to this uh, idea of creating videos. So you create videos and doubtless what you'll need to do is edit them at some mm. point. Uh, some of these tools that you see here might have editing facilities built in, especially if it's on uh, an iPad, for instance, or say on Panopto, it has got very limited ability to cut out the bits you don't want. Um, but I think some of us find that we have to edit things to maybe add a, a better title or to create some transition effects because they, they help the experience. So um, it would be really good for people to, um, uh, you know, when you can come back to this and look at, you know, the different techniques and the, the terminology, if it's the first time that you're kind of starting to use these tools. Um, but for some of us, we have um, started off in with something like Movie Maker or iMovie or anything that's already built into our laptops. Uh, and some people here are more experienced digital producers. So it'd be quite interesting to, to get uh, their take on what tools they've used uh, for editing. So are people able to contribute to this Padlet? Yep, iMovie, Premiere Pro, a few more. So this Wii video, I'm going to have to explore that afterwards since it, it's come up quite a bit. For those of you who don't know where Windows Movie Maker has gone, it's filed under Photo, of course, this is Microsoft. Um, so uh, what I try to do is recommend to lecturers things that I know they've got on their PC. So whether it's um, Panopto related or if it's something more sophisticated, then I would take them to something like Windows Photo as a first um, port of call. But obviously, once someone gets familiar and wants something more powerful, then here's the whole range <laughs> that people are listing, um, some of which require licenses, of course. Okay. So, yeah, of course, the other thing is if you want students to do video projects, again, you have to um, do a bit of research on what they have easily available to them. Uh, we have to worry about sending students off to third party sites. Um, so, you know, that's always got to be balanced and uh, uh, taken into account. Yes. Um, okay. So, we can continue to add to the Padlets outside of this. Um, sorry for traipsing through so quickly. I think some people really wanted to know the, the kind of simple tools they could use. So I'm glad we've managed to capture some of that from the audience. Um, so Digcomp Edu, this is the framework that we're kind of using for future teacher. Um, if I guess JISC has got its own um, uh, framework, digital capability profiles. Uh, ev everyone's working to some frameworks nowadays. Um, this is the European framework and actually it, it's, there's a lot of common sense things in there and it looks specifically at your digital skills when it comes to teaching and learning. So it's quite a nice reflection point. Um, it allows you to kind of have a think about um, how 
learning to use video or your students learning to, to use video uh, is actually part of you developing their skills and competencies. Um, and that takes us to the promotion, if you like, of our future teacher conference. Uh, we've created 12 of these webinars so far. We've got another five or six to go. But this is a chance for all of us who have been regulars to meet up. Um, and uh, we've chosen University of York. It's kind of midpoint between Edinburgh and uh, Wales or <laughs> Kent, I think. <laughs> um, so um, this is a chance for, for us to get together. Uh, it'd be really, really nice to see some of you. Um, we've invited some of our um, speakers uh, to, to come along and attend as well. So it's a chance to kind of have some um, in-depth time with these people. What we'd really like to see is um, if you're a learning technologist or you're quite advanced in your own skills, try to bring a colleague along who's maybe just starting out on their journey. If they've never um, experienced or attended a kind of learning technology conference, then this is very much for them. You know, we're, we're kind of going to make sure that we have enough people to look after um, those who, who want a bit of hand-holding and a bit of easy introduction into the whole world of learning technology. Um, and we'd love to see you there, of course. So save the date and uh, follow the link. And now I'll pass you back to Ron. Okay, thanks, Lillian. Um, just very quickly, we do have one final activity. But um, before we do that, um, the usual reminder to join our Gmail list if you haven't already, because that's where we'll um, post updates and, and further resources and so on. Um, I'll skip past that activity first. There's the summary there of... Um, the next webinar, which is about getting savvy with digital tools and resources. And there's the date, it's 1 p.m. on Thursday, 25th of October. It's a Thursday, I think it's the first Thursday um, we've uh, had one of the webinars. Um, Always breaking new ground, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> Always innovating, eh? Yeah. Um, and then finally, there's a point um, about this resource being Xerti and Creative Commons and a, and a link to it. Um, but our final um, activity, as usual, is to to share in the text chat um, what one thing you would do as a result of what we discussed. And we, we usually get the, the predictable responses that you'll review the resources and so on. But if you can kind of cite, a, 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 you know, perhaps a, a more definite action that you'll, you'll do and, and things that you'll try, then that would be useful for us. And we'll, we'll include those kind of things in, in the resources in future as well. Um, we did wonder about opening up um, the webcams and getting everyone to switch the webcams on at this point because um, a few people uh, obviously did that as you may have noticed during the presentation as well but we decided that with 50 odd 57 people I think there was at one point um, in the webinar it would just become chaos not least of which with the audio um, but we do normally have a, a kind of an informal discussion here when we stop the recording, which I'll um, uh, stop now, I guess, unless Lillian or Alistair want to make any just last minute comments before we stop the recording. I think the um, only thing just to put while the recording is still going is thank you very much to our guest presenters, to Rob and Tim. Absolutely, um, yeah. Thank you also. We were really overwhelmed with lots and lots of people on different lists giving us suggestions. Um, which we've incorporated either into the mind map or into the learning resource. So thank you very much, everybody. Okay, I'll stop the recording now, but then we'll continue our little informal chat before uh, until everyone has uh, kind of vacated and gone off to have, well, not lunch, I suppose lunch is over, is it? <laughs> well, except for you, because it's 